Welcome to another episode of Shattered Lives, the Irish Daily Star's crime podcast. I'm crime correspondent Michael O'Toole and today Chief Reporter Paul Healy joins me to discuss a pretty sensational interview he has in today's paper. It is with convicted Republican Shane Rowan, who was jailed when he was caught by the Garda Special Branch, transporting the three Kalashnikov rifles used by the Hutch Gang in the attack on the Regency Airport Hotel in February 2016, in which David Byrne was shot dead. As you will all be aware by now, Jerry the Monk Hutch is awaiting his verdict in the special criminal court trial over that killing. He denies the murder. Two men, Jason Bonney and Paul Murphy, were on trial with him and denied facilitating the murder by providing the gang with cars. Neither was charged with murder. All three will learn their fate by April 17th at the latest. So, let's talk to Paul about this bombshell interview with Shane Rowan today. Hello Paul. How's it going Mick? So this is the beauty of this pod. We were doing it on the Jerry Hutch trial. We moved away from it because the trial has effectively ended and Miss Justice Tara Burns and her two colleagues in the Special Criminal Court are now, as everybody knows, deliberating on their verdict and we expect that by the 17th of April at the latest. Now, we thought we were more or less done with it, might be a few things to go at the end, but something happened that has made us come back to the, the, the case. Yeah, well, as you say, we were moving on to other things, but uh, stories tend to breed uh, other stories is the way it seems to work. And, and it had an extraordinary development this week. Um, I was contacted by none other than Shane Rohn. Um, now, just to remind people, uh, Mr. Rohn's name came up quite a bit uh, in the course of the trial. Uh, he did make headlines back in 2016, but I, I, I would submit that relatively few people remembered him at that point in time. Um because it was kind of it was a case that was over and dealt with very quickly. Um, Shane Rohn is the man who was caught with the AK-47s, the Kalashnikov rifles to be more exact, um, that were used in the Regency Hotel uh, shooting. And he was caught on the 9th of March 2016 uh, up in the Slane County Mead area, uh, apprehended by Gardaí, pulled over and uh, arrested and caught with the weapons in the boot of the car. Um, and today, now, there is no doubt. Sorry, sorry, yeah. Paul, just interject. There is no doubt that these three assault rifles were the rifles that were used in the Regency gun attack in which David Byrne was killed. Because uh, this trial and also the, the, the previous trial of Patrick Hutch, in which Nolly Prosecchi was entered, he wasn't convicted. But in both those cases, there was ballistic evidence that casings and bullets themselves from the scene matched the, the bullets in the rifle of the three and the magazine of the three rifles that were seized so they are the weapons that were used in the regency yes there, there's there's no doubt about that um and as we already just dis- discussed at length although they keep being referred to as ak-47s they were in fact uh, kalashnikov rifles and and then three different ones am i right for three different one was chinese i seem to recall one was a zastava which I th- uh, which is from the former yugoslav republic and i think the third one was Romanian. So the AK-47s themselves are Russian-made, Alexander Kalashnikov in Russia, but it's the most, probably the most widely used generic assault rifle in the world. And there are loads of countries have them unlicensed. China has them, uh, Serbia and all had them. So we just call them Kalashnikovs. Yeah. Now, now to, to again, just give people a little bit of context uh, to the background of this, and we've, we, we heard much more about Shane Rowan's involvement in this trial, in the trial of, of Jerry Hutch, because in, 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 Shane's, in Shane Rowan's trial, he pleaded guilty and he was put away quite quickly um, for, to, a, a, I think, a seven and a half year sentence for possession of firearms and for membership of the IRA. And in, so in his, in his trial, relatively nothing really was mentioned in relation to the Regency Hotel. It was, he was done for the firearms and that was that. And what, what developed after that uh, put, eventually put context, uh, put a lot more context into it. But to remind people uh, of, a, of a key detail, that Shane Rowan is from the Donegal area, Killigordon, and he drove on the 9th of March all the way from Killigordon, County Donegal, down to the Malahide Industrial Estate in Dublin, where he met with Patsy Hutch, a uh, brother of Jerry, the monk Hutch. Now, Patsy Hutch is not charged with any criminal offence, uh, but the interesting element of this is that Shane Rowan met with Patsy, 
uh, they met in, and they sat in a, a Toyota Yaris for a period of time. Shane Rowan had abandoned his vehicle, uh, the, the Insignia, and during that course of time, individuals placed the AK-47 rifles into the boot of the car. Then Rowan got back into the car and drove it and was subsequently caught with the weapons. So that's the sequence of events, just to remind people. And just two small bits of context. We've said this before, he was convicted of IRA membership, but that's a yes. generic term that could be any one of any groups. So m- people may think it's the provisional area, but it could be anything. And obviously, as I've explained before, you know, the offence is belonging to Ugly Inherent, self styled Ugly Inherent, calling itself the IRA. And that's what anybody charged with any Republican group, apart from the INLA, is charged with. So, and the other aspect is, you said he, obviously he got seven and a half years, and that was in 2016. So, People's maths will probably work out that that's about now, but we probably need to explain. I think he was in custody from 2016 and he, like every other prisoner, is entitled to 25% remission. So he's out and he's been out a good while and that's no surprise. He didn't get any early deal. He did his time. He got his remission and Shinne, really. Yeah, now look, to my surprise, uh, I... I, I um, was contacted by Mr. Rowan this week. Um, and now people might initially wonder, well, why are you giving this man airtime? He's a convicted criminal. Everyone is entitled to tell their story. That That's my belief. And that's what I said to Mr. Rowan. Uh, it's up to to you, uh, the public, to, to, to make what you will of what he has to say. Uh, I have to be impartial. I did challenge him on certain uh, aspects. I would say that he was pretty open and honest about uh, you know, as, as, as about his involvement, pretty, pretty well open in terms of, you know, he accepts his guilt. He says he did his time. And I'm going to just give you a, a we have the story out uh, today in the Star newspaper and on the Mirror Online, but just to give people some, some context of what Mr. Rowan was saying. Um, I mean, it was really bombshell stuff. So, so he told me, and this, this would be information that we've learned for the first time, uh, that he was contacted about these weapons and they were offered to him uh, by individuals that I'm not going to identify here. Uh, and he says uh, that, that the offer was 10 grand per weapon. So he was willing to put up 30,000 euro uh, for the rifles. Now I asked him what was the use of these rifles? What, what benefit were you getting? Uh, in using these rifles and he said that they were for his quote unquote unit and now we know he's a convicted member of the IRA and he, he he's mentioning that he has a particular unit you might be able to shed light on on a unit Mick so yeah I will I just want to say one thing that Paul in case anybody is asking as they probably will you did st- take steps to establish the veracity of this man's identity uh, I did and look I asked Mr Rowan actually would he be willing to be heard uh, he Look, he's not. He he didn't want to come on the podcast or anything like that, or or have uh, any audio of an interview played uh, for for anybody. So, uh, I did verify that it was Mr. Roan. Uh, we took various steps uh, t- to do that. I won't go through them all in great detail, but it was him. Okay. So, so it was. So when I when I my analysis of when he's talking about his unit, that is a reference to what I would call an ASU or an active service unit. So this was. Active service units were first formed by the provisional IRA uh, early to mid 1970s. They had a security reassessment. They used to, at the start of the troubles, they acted in sort of battalion lines and everybody knew everybody. So they brought in active service units and it could be four or five or six people all working together. And the key point is they're an active service unit. They they do their paramilitary activity together, but they're very, very tight and nobody outside is supposed to know who is in that group. So it's supposed to improve the security. And obviously, distant Republican groups have taken on this and the most uh, Republican distant groups would, would have would have what they would call active service units or ASUs. And when it comes to his unit, uh, uh, Mr. I'm not going to quote everything that he said to me here because you can read it uh, in today's star. But uh, he said that the, the reason for getting these weapons was uh, you're, you're kind of getting a little bit of firepower for your unit. That's basically it. You can have small weaponry, but it's not really good for anything. It's heavy artillery and you can never have too many. Uh, I asked him, look, in what, in what event would, would such artillery be being used by you or your unit? And he said... Uh, in the event that you want to take someone out, uh, it's a decent enough L weapon. You know what I mean. You get a good distance. You can have a good pop from far enough away. It will do what you want to do. A handgun is okay, but you've got to get up close. You never get up close to anybody in the security forces, to be honest with you. 
you just never know and uh, you know if you get your opportunity you can have a, uh, why not have a wee whack like he said and, and he's right so there are two variants ammunition wise without being totally in terms of distance of, you mean yeah it, right? yeah it's because you know it all depends i think so there's the 5.56 millimeter and there's the 7.62 which is the ak-47 but i think the three kalashnikovs that were seized from rowan were 5.56 but they're still military grade assault rifles and that now i i i, I don't want to be a hostage to fortune but you're probably talking about an effective range of maybe 250 to 300 meters a a, a, a pistol meh, 30 meters 40 meters really so you you know it is and they are they are heavy weaponry they're military style weaponry and they would go through well they would cause serious damage to somebody if they hit them even from several hundred meters yeah now look i i put it to mr owen that what he was saying here about you know why not have a wee whack like and stuff like that it's not painting them in a good light I mean, it doesn't sound good to be saying things like that uh to be admitting that you're taking in weapons and that they might be used as a means of violence and he said i know it sounds bad i'm not going to sugarcoat it i know it's harsh um you know he said it's not america where you're going to have it on you at all times you're going to put it to bed until you have a chance to use it he said that a couple of times see that he, that his uh, intention was to put the weapons to bed and what he meant by that was that he his intention was to bury the ak-47s and that perhaps if an opportunity arose that they might be used uh, to further his Republican cause. Another th- interesting thing that he mentioned was that 2016 would have been the centenary of the 1916 Rising, and he indicated that perhaps in a way of commemorating that, that perhaps the the rifles could be used in some way, uh, be, that, be it fired off or, or used to uh, indicate that his quote-unquote unit had a bit of firepower behind them. Um, I do know that there were fears around 2016 that dissidents were going to do something, so... You know, that's not too far away to the mark. Yeah, I mean, it, it's an extraordinary quote from him here. A, a crowd of young fellas having a go, like, coming up to 2016, your granddad, your grannies, your great granddads might have been involved back in the day. You grow up a lot hearing about it, listening about it. You think to yourself, you know what, 100 years maybe, fire off a couple of shots, do something to commemorate them, more or less. That's what I was at. When I'm sitting on my deathbed, at least I can say I've done something, rightly or wrongly, as you say, for your country. I'm just going to put on my anorak again for a second. What's really interesting was uh, during the Troubles, 87, uh, Exxon, when it came in, all the, the Libyan arms came into the IRA. The IRA had hundreds, probably thousands of Kalashnikovs, and that wasn't their problem. It's the exact opposite of what he, what he was saying. The IRA didn't have any. What, so the, the IRA called weapons long and shorts. So shorts are pistols, right? And they didn't have enough pistols and they didn't have enough weapons that they could hide in coats. So what he's saying about you wouldn't carry it. They had plenty of, of longs, of AKs and stuff. They didn't have any pistols so they could go up and use it to get up close and personal. I just thought it's interesting because it's the direct opposite of what the IRA faced during the Troubles. That's interesting. Um, just, you know, in terms of his IRA membership, Mr. Owen says he's not involved now and because of his actions, he would have effectively been... Uh, um, excommunicated or be it whatever term uh, you might want to give it so he says he's out on his own now and that he's not involved in any way in relation to that he, he but he, he says he doesn't regret uh, the actions that he took um, and he insists that he has no involvement with the Hutch gang he doesn't even know if there is a quote unquote Hutch gang he just says he's no involvement with them or with the feud in any way um and and you know you spoke to me in great detail about that day that he went down and he met patsy hutch and sitting in the yaris with him he said there wasn't even a conversation between the pair of them um and he 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 indicated that this wasn't his first uh shall we say um this wasn't his first rodeo uh and in dealing with a job of this nature you don't talk he says you don't discuss what's going on they sat in the car and as they sat in the car, the rifles are being put into the insignia. And he says to this day, he doesn't even know um, the individuals that put the rifles into the car. He didn't ask questions. Um, the only conversation he says he recalls having with Patsy was when Patsy went into the apple green to get coffee, tea or coffee. And he asked him, do you take sugar in your tea? And uh, 
that's the only recognition rec- recollection he has the other uh, thing which was mentioned in the trial um the two of them were sitting at the traffic lights and the the, the nsu officers which were watching this whole thing and, and Rowan didn't realize they were being watched uh, up until this point um the two of them spoke um from each of their vehicles to each other they were observed doing so and he told me that that conversation was he he saw two cars parked near them and he, he said to patsy are, are they your lads and patsy said something like no uh, and he said i think they might be cops well <laughs> his suspicions might have been true be, uh, might have been on the money because not long after that he's being followed up the malahide road uh, and in the direction of slain where he was eventually pulled over by the cops and and caught and again he was quite open about that whole uh, thing uh, he he feared that he was about to get caught he he felt that he was being chased uh, he said he saw the jeeps behind him and it it occurred to him he said i was going to i was going to pull over and throw the weapons out of the vehicle and he said that it, it, even if at least if i got caught the weapons wouldn't be in the car but he realized it was too late he, he he couldn't get past he said there was a car in his way he couldn't he couldn't do anything he said he pulled over more or less accepted his fate that he had been caught red-handed. He actually said, I was caught red-handed. Did he talk about the the stop itself? Because this is really interesting. Well, well, he says he pulled over and uh, he was uh, forcibly removed from the vehicle. Uh, and he ended up in, in hospital uh, as a result of whatever happened there. But I, what are you referring to? Well, no, I just I, I just want to know what it's like. To, it was obviously, you, you mentioned the NSU, that's the National Surveillance Unit, who were carrying out the, the surveillance. But, you know, they don't really, very rarely do they do interceptions themselves. Sometimes they will have to, an extremist, but it's mostly the Special Detective Unit, SDU or Special Branch, who do the, the hard stop. So... I, I just, I've always, I hope I never have to find out, but I'd be interested to know what he said from his perspective of having five or six burly SDU lads with SIGs pointing at his door and, uh, and inviting him to leave and vacate the car. It must have been a very interesting experience. Yeah, well, he said some things which I'm not going to repeat here. Uh, but So it, they, were, they were robust, it, is that fair? It was, it, was, it was a robust experience for Mr. Rowan, yes. Uh, uh, he says he, he went to a uh, hospital before then, uh, giving Gardy no comment uh, in three different interviews, apparently. He says uh, then he, he put his hands up when he was in court, uh, admitted his guilt, uh, did his time, and got, over, got, got along with it, he basically said. Um, you know, there, there's good stuff, that he, the, just interesting detail that he said to me beforehand about battering the steering wheel and saying fuck fuck i've been caught so he realized that he was screwed in that moment um but no, but he did have a sixth sense yeah when he was in malahide he just he, there was something on him. he figured something was up well that's the other thing that he said to me that uh, he re- revealed to me that um that he had done a dry run a couple of days beforehand um and that he'd actually gone back he, he, he turned back and went back to donegal because he feared at that point in time that he was being watched um, he actually was under surveillance at that point in time so he was paranoid that he was being watched and now I did challenge him why would you get involved with these people he more or less put it down to you know uh, it's another job an opportunity to get more artillery he had nothing to do with the hutches or the feud you know I put it to him well why would you go all the way to Dublin to pick up these weapons uh, and he said that if he'd known that they were the guns used in the Regency that he wouldn't have gone down uh, to Dublin to get them uh, and that he, he they, they would have been transported to him. But, he, you know, he had suspicions, he said, that they were the weapons used in the Regency, but he didn't <sighs> believe that they were. He, did, he said he didn't believe that they would be so stupid uh, as to uh, still have the weapons at that point. He, thought they, he said, I thought they would have been in the Liffey or the Irish Sea at that point. Right, I'm sorry. Did he come up the lock in a bubble here? There were Kalashnikovs used in the Regency, and... People approach him offering to sell him three Kalashnikov style rifles for 10 grand each. You know, you can't put two and two together and get four. I know. Well, I mean, I, I challenged him on that. And look, he insisted that he didn't know. He, ser- he said he certainly had a suspicion. But I mean, he said it wouldn't have changed anything for him either way. If they had come up front and told him that they were the weapons used in the Regency, he said he still would have bought them. Mm. And that, that, I mean, there is, there, I mean, just from the history of the Troubles, the IRA repeatedly used weapons. We've seen, I mean, I can think of one uh, case. I won't name it, but it was one of the feud murders. And there is CCTV footage of him. We know in several cases that it's particularly the Kenyans, they used handguns, shorts, and they, they, they carried out the murders and they dropped the pistols at the scene. But IRA people, IRA Republicans have got a real attachment to weapons. 
And, you know, they would, we know that uh, IRA weapons in the Troubles were seized and they were linked to maybe 20 murders or maybe a dozen murders. You know what I mean? So the, the IRA, there is a republicanism view of you keep your weapons as much as you can so you know that that does ring true yeah well, i mean here's a quote from him we're in that game i'm not going to question every weapon i get it's just not done no armed group would ever question the background of something mm. um you know and and he 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 did uh, speak to me it's not in the article but i just based off what you said i recall him saying you know there are differences between a criminal gang and republicans in that a criminal gang is just going to get rid of weapons republicans will, will hold on to them mm. he did say that and th- there's a the the IRA, the provisional IRA, have a thing called the Green Book, which it, or had a thing, well, I have a thing in my view, called the Green Book. And, you know, that's their, their rules. And one of the things is about weaponry. It's an offence punishable by death if you steal a, an IRA weapon. So there, uh, IRA weapons are, re- weapons are really, really important to the IRA. And that's, you know, well, God, this has gone off in a huge time. That's why decommissioning was such a big thing for them about, because it's weaponry. And, you know, you know, people have served prison sentences for bringing weapons in. So they're, I'm not going to say there's an attachment, but they realise the importance of individual weapons. Whereas the Kenyans, they use their SIGs or Glocks, whatever, and they leave them at the scene. Now, I know why they do that, because it's better to leave a, a, a firearm at the scene of a murder, because it'll be clean, there'll be no forensics on it from yourself. And if you're caught around the corner, you can say, what gun? I'm just there. For-. You know what I mean? That's why they do that. But there, there's a different attitude amongst republicanism to firearms and weapons. Yeah, it's very interesting. I have to say it was it was fascinating to listen to Mr. Rowan's account. I, I spoke to him for over two and a half hours um, and there's a lot more which we haven't yet printed. And I'm going to be cautious about uh, uh, saying too much about that to, until I see what we can print. But uh, look, people will recollect um, that um, from the trial that, that Jerry Hutch and Jonathan Dowdall uh, met with Shane Rowan uh, at his home in Donegal um, yes, after the Regency. And I did speak to Mr. Rowan in detail about that and about his dealings with Jerry Hutch and what he made of Jerry Hutch and uh, what he says was going on in that meeting. We talked about the the infamous plug uh, and what Dowdall claimed was happening with the plug and, and, and there's a whole lot there. Um, but we'll leave, we might leave that for the next day and discuss that in more detail. Right. I've got a couple of questions. Yes. He Did he say who approached him with the offer of buying the guns? Yes. Okay. Are we going to name that person? No. Okay. No, that's fair enough. Right. Uh, thank God for legals. Now, this raises another massive question for me, right? If, but, but, he, but he did effectively say it was the Hutch gang who offered them the firearms, yeah, well, did he? He, uh, uh, he? he doesn't know whether there is a Hutch gang, but yes, okay. uh, associates of, of, of who are certainly who we're talking about, Hutches, yes. Right. Okay, just on that point. Detective Superintendent Dave Gallagher from the Drugs and Organised Crime Bureau did give significant evidence about the existence of the Hutch crime gang. So that is evidence that has been heard in court and has been accepted. And I think it's unchallenged by the defence. So he said there is a Hutch organised crime gang. Okay. now what really fascinates me. So the Hutch crime gang or the crime gang or the people involved in the reason were trying to get rid of these Kalashnikovs. Okay. where did they get them from in the first place? That's a fascinating question, and uh, we still aren't, aren't See, I'd always wiser had, to that. You know, somebody told me that journalists get to hear 10% of, the, of what's actually going on, and it's probably true. So I'd always had the belief that, you know, maybe they got them from dissident Republicans and were bringing them back to Donegal to return them to dissident Republicans. But that's clearly not the case. So, uh, according to Shane Rowan, if you're to under if you're to if you were to believe Mr. Rowan's account, this is his first interaction with these guns, purchasing them from the the Hutch gang. Yeah, and it doesn't really make sense that if dissidents lent them to the Hutch, to the gang, the Hutch gang, the the people involved in the Regency, why would they sell them back to them? That, that makes no sense. So no. if you believe his story, the Hutch's criminal gang got these weapons from somewhere and decided to get rid of them and make a few quid. Right? Where did they come from? Yeah, we're still on the wiser to that. It's a great question. Yeah, um, it really is. Uh, and I have to say, uh, hopefully we will get to, to talk about and print uh, more of the interview. But uh, Mr. Rowan had a fascinating insight into uh, some of the other uh, Republicans, uh, dissidents, people in that world uh, that he would have, uh, shall we say, introduced um, Jerry Hutch and Jonathan Dowdall to and, the, you know, those meetings and what they were about um, and then 
Jonathan Dowdall's involvement with these people, or, or rather, the, rather his bravado and claims about being involved with these people, it, it's fascinating to hear his account. So um, we'll we'll see whether we get to talk about that tomorrow. I, I- and you know what, Healy, I love it when you do an interview and you get two days out of it. Because there's so much. You have to, it's just brilliant. You have to break it up into two days. But look, just, well, we'll just move on. And just, I might just say, probably before we move on, is that, that, uh, you know, regardless of, of what you think about Mr. Roan and, and his account, uh, he's entitled to tell his story and, and fair play to him for coming forward and, and, and to speaking, um, to us and to telling his story. Right. Let's talk about something else. A story I, I did in the Star and the Mirror on Monday. And, you know, I'm glad we can talk about this because, look, the whole focus of this trial has obviously been what Detective Superintendent Dave, Ca- uh, Dave Campbell calls the Hutch Organised Crime Gang and the, the murder of, of David Bird. But let's not forget, there are two gangs involved in this feud. 18 people are dead and of those 18 people, 16 people were murdered by the Kenahan Gang. And the Kenahan Gang are so much bigger than the Hutch Gang, it's untrue. You can't really describe how bigger. We know they're a billion euro cartel. So obviously a lot of focus in our pod and the, the, the trial has been about the Hutch gang. But the, the Kenahans are, are mahusive. Let's just say that, right? So, and you know, they're, they're still out there and they're still, we know that they're sanctioned. There's $15 million rewards for Christopher Sr., Daniel, the main man, and Christy, Christopher Jr., the, uh, the brother. So... We had a story in the Star on Monday. It came from a, a paper, the Zimbabwe Independent in Zimbabwe. And we knew that uh, there were, the Irish Times were involved in this and there were papers in Africa were involved in this investigation a, a couple of months ago. And they talked about how Christopher Kinahan Sr. was trying to you know, get, get involved in Zimbabwe. And, you know, he was using that as a base, say, for trying to buy aircraft you know all that sort of thing trying to legitimize himself but one interesting thing that came about that we we reported in in the star on monday is that the zimbabwe media are reporting two th- three things actually which are very interesting firstly that they're now saying that that christopher kinnan the christie the dapper don has made zimbabwe his base okay now he might not there be there permanently but it seems to be his home from home shall we say and it's a place where he is increasingly act uh secondly the reports said that he is being allowed to have Zimbabwe as a base because he has Zimbab- some Zimbabwe politicians in his pocket, right? So there's corruption there. And then the third aspect is that the paper claimed that there was a fleet of cars available for members of the Kenyan cartel who were coming from Turkey, Ireland, Europe and the United Arab Emirates. So that's just not one person. So it does appear that Zimbabwe is becoming more and more important for the Kenyan cartel. And they were saying that, you know, Daniel, Christopher Kinnan is, is, is using his drugs money to pay off certain politicians and is using Zimbabwe as a base. So let's not forget how big and important the Kenyan gang are and they're still out there. Massive, uh, but... It- in, 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 it shows two things, it doesn't it really, that it shows you the scope, uh, the power that they have, but also maybe on another level, maybe the desperation at this point that, that Christy Kinahan is now having to turn to Zimbabwe and, and, and hide himself uh, to a degree. I mean, he can no longer enjoy, we know now that he was uh, a, a successful businessman and, and property owner out, out in Dubai and involved in a multitude of companies and was not hiding his face at all um, uh, and now look at the situation that he finds himself in as a result of the sanctions. And he, w- he went by the name, I know you, you did story on this, he went by the name Christopher Vincent, not Christopher Kennan, but, but Vincent is, if I recall, his middle name. So he wasn't, exa- he was, he was, he wasn't exactly hiding and if he was hiding, he was hiding in plain sight. No, I mean, it was, the company was, I think one of the companies was even named Christopher Vincent something, uh, something or yeah. other. Yeah, like, I mean, so, you know, I mean, he was living a, a fairly open life, as was his, well, Daniel especially, but uh, we've we've seen no indication of where he is, have we? <laughs> so, one of the pods, so look, I know, I'm not saying it's a criticism, but people have said, you know, you got to talk about the Guinness, and we side. have, yeah. and we're on it, well, yeah, but it's it's a trial for Jerry Hutch. And we can't ignore that, but we're very keen. And, you know, we are going to do more of the pod. And one thing I'm thinking of, it's the, it's that, the, what is it, 21st of April was the press conference that, was it the 20, I don't I was banned from it, so I can't remember the date. But uh, it, it was around the 21st of April. So that might be a good time for us to do a look back on how successful 
kit, the, the guards and international law enforcement have been in cracking Ken, in the Kenahan cartel and what the future lies in. But that's that's a that's just over a month away, so we'll, we'll keep going. Oh, they haven't gone away, and they're well worth discussing. So um, we just thought we'd jump on and, and talk about this because it was an unexpected development, an unexpected development as a result of this pod, actually, because. Um, look, Mr. Rowan contacted uh, myself as a result of of uh, listening to our coverage, and 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 he, he look he stated that uh, that is why he got in contact. And he, as I said, it's up to people to judge what they make of his story. We'll be discussing a bit more about what he said about Jerry Hutch and Jonathan Dowd all tomorrow. So uh, we hope you listen in. Thanks for your time, uh, and stay tuned for part two. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you.